Well, hello, everyone. I am so glad I'm back in a technically um, viable environment. Hotel rooms are very unreliable as far as doing anything. I mean, you can download your email, but as far as broadcasting or doing anything live, their systems can't handle it. They don't give you a lot of bandwidth. And I actually even paid to upgrade my bandwidth so that I would have enough bandwidth and their whole internet went down. So um, thank you for rescheduling for today. We are actually going to do two Facebook Lives today because we already had one scheduled for tonight. And I'll still do that one with my coach, Elise. Hi, everyone. Hi, April. Hi, Brandy. So good to see you. Um, so we're going to do two today. Right now, we're going to make up our one from yesterday on isolation. I went through all your comments, and you guys are so wise to this topic already. And then um, we're going to do another one tonight on why marriage counseling isn't the best option if you are in a destructive marriage. Now, I have done marriage counseling for 35 years. I have made all the mistakes that you can make, and I don't recommend it. It's not that it doesn't work. Marriage counseling can be very effective for certain problems in certain situations in certain marriages, but not in destructive and abusive ones. And I'll explain why tonight. So if that's something that you're curious about, come back tonight at 7.30, same place, and we will talk. Also, we are giving out prizes. You can get a Starbucks gift card, an Amazon gift card, or one of my books personally signed for you. Um, just for participating in this Facebook Live, we will draw a name at the end. So stay here, stay with us. Today, our topic is isolation. Isolation is something that doesn't seem obvious as a tactic for abusers. But across the board, anyone who wants control over another person is going to use isolation as a tactic. So it's really important that you get smart about these tactics of abusive relationships. And I, I love to read about different people in different situations and watch movies. I'm just kind of a curious girl about life. And I remember watching, how many of you watched the movie, The Villages from the M. Shamblin? It was an old movie. If you haven't watched it about isolation, you've got to watch this movie. Now, these people were well-intended. So it wasn't like they were malicious. Sometimes even as parents, we're well-intended. We want to put our kids in a bumble, bubble and isolate them from the world. Uh, we don't have a TV. We don't, you know, go to movies. We don't, you know, watch certain things. We don't. And we put this little bubble around our kids because we don't want them to be influenced by the world. So what happens when you're isolated is right. You don't get influenced or you don't hear other points of view. If you were only to watch Fox News, and I watch Fox News, but I also watch BBC, I watch CNN, I kind of diversify my news intake because they're not telling the truth on any of the stations. And you've got to weed through a lot of different stuff to figure out what you're going to believe. But if you are isolating yourself intellectually or physically, so going back to this movie by M. Shamblin on the villages, this is a well-intended group of people who believed that the world was a scary place, maybe like right now. When the movie took place, the scene was a place in Pennsylvania, right where I lived. So I wanted to watch this movie. Um, and so they created this village, this city inside of a forest that's pretty dense. And they raised their children. So it was like almost two generations now of children who thought this was the world, that there was no other place in the world, in the whole world now, than this little village. It was very isolated. And the way they kept them there was through boogeymen, as people do for us. When we're in um, being isolated, boogeymen, enemies are out to get you. Bad people are out to corrupt your kid's mind. The school system is corrupt, the political system. And they are. They are to some degree. But is the solution isolation? And so in this movie, one of the characters uh, gets ill. And his girlfriend wants to go outside the village to see if there's somebody who might have medicine. And the adults of the village dress up as boogeymen to scare the kids from going outside into the woods. Like it's dangerous, it's a dangerous place. And it just reminded me as I was watching, she finally did get to the other side and realized, oh my gosh, here's a car. I never saw a car before, here's an airplane. Oh my gosh, there's a whole other world that I know nothing about. And what it struck me about that whole movie on isolation was the control it had over people, the fear that it put in people if you weren't to follow the rules of the village. And also, 
it reminded me some of the church. At the time, as a Christian counselor, I was exploring, like, is the church right about these things? You know, like, there's no divorce except for these things, or is the church? And I was kind of the bad guy because I was going outside the rules of the way the church, my church, the conservative church that I attended was saying things were true. And as I began to step into the forest, the boogeymen were like, Leslie, you're going to get corrupted. You're going to go off the deep end, all those kind of things. And so some of you put in the, in the chat that isolation serves to reduce your pathway for fresh air, right? So if we look at Nexium, the cult where those women got branded as sex slaves, adult women who weren't unintelligent, they were movie stars that got sucked into this cult and got some of them got all the way to the end where they were his personal sex slaves and they bought it. They bought the philosophy because they isolated themselves from other people. They didn't speak the truth about what was going on in this organization where other people might say, that's nuts. Don't do that. That's crazy. What are you doing? And so isolation is a tactic that people use for prisoners of war to break them down. They use in cults to break them down. And it starts with love bombing. So whether you're a cult and you invite someone to a great weekend of, you know, encouragement and support and love bombing, you're wonderful. We've loved you like no one has loved you. We love you better than your parents, right? I mean, that's love bombing from a cult perspective. But when you're dating someone and they're love bombing and no one's going to love you like I do, and it's us against the world, girl, and we're going to be our own family. And no, your family isn't right. They're, they're trying to, you know, break up our family because the Bible says you should leave and cleave and all the things that they say. And here's where we as targets are vulnerable. We let them. We're so intoxicated by the flattery because our little bucket is so empty. We're so intoxicated by the um, ego boosting, like I'm wanted, I belong here, somebody cares about me, that it's easy to kind of turn off our thinking cap and let ourselves be more and more isolated. Now, I want to talk about two kinds of isolation today because um, some people brought it up in the chat. And one is where someone else isolates you and you agree to that out of your loyalty, especially in marriage or in a cult. If you're in a church, you might have some things like Catholics did it for a long time. You're not allowed to attend another church, right? If you attend another church besides Catholic, you're going to hell. They don't do that anymore, but they used to do that to control their tribe. All right. Maybe your church does that, that, that if you, you know, if you read anything but the King James Bible, or if you read certain other books, or you listen to psychology or whatever they're telling you is the boogeyman out there, you're going to be corrupted. I think our whole culture is moving into isolation camps, Democrats, Republicans, you know, Muslims, Christians, atheists, you know, and, and the other guys are the boogeyman. Other guys are the bad guys. We're not having community of conversation. We're not talking to one another, even if we disagree, even if we see things differently. I've had some of the best conversations with people I don't agree with, but it's opened my mind to looking at things from different perspectives that I might not have seen had I allowed myself to be isolated. So ladies, one of the things that is a, a good quality in you that makes you more vulnerable to being isolated is your high degree of loyalty. So when you marry someone who knows that you're a loyal girl, and we should be loyal, that's a good quality. I'm not saying don't be, be disloyal or be a betrayer, but they capitalize on that. It's you and me, nobody else. Don't tell my stuff to the pastor. I went to church with my dad last Sunday. You know, my dad just lost my mom and he hasn't been back to church since. So when I was in Chicago, I said, let's go to church, dad. And the pastor was speaking in Second First uh, Peter, the whole passage about women submitting. And I didn't like everything he said, but one thing he did say is, hey, wives, if you're being abused in any way, the Bible says that you're to come to the church and tell us. So submission doesn't mean you submit to abuse. And I loved, and we've had conversations, I love that he said that, he probably said it out loud because I was in the audience and he saw me, <laughs> but he said it out loud. If you're being abused, come to the elders of the church and we will help you. And I thought, yay, yay, that's what... That's what the Bible tells you to do, but your husband will tell you that's disloyal. That's breaking the rules of marriage, that our stuff is our stuff. All that kind of stuff that makes you feel guilty when you tell 
when you have a, a conversation with a girlfriend and say, does this happen in your home? Does your husband treat you this way just so you can get some fresh air? You know, I love talking with other Christians. So why do you believe that it's okay to be a homosexual when the Bible says not? I want to hear from them. I want to understand how they're thinking. If I don't listen and I'm not willing to learn, even if I continue to disagree, I used to debate on TV sometimes people who were pro-choice. Pro I wanted to understand and I want it not in an um, enemy kind of way, but in a Let's have a conversation about this very important topic. And I'd love to hear your point of view and why you think this. And, and that's how we grow. That's how we learn. So when your husband tries to isolate you or your church isolates you, understand that that's not the way of Jesus when he says separate yourself from the world or don't be a part. You're in the world but not of the world. doesn't mean you can't learn from the world or have a conversation with the world so that you understand their heart. You understand how they think. And when someone tries to keep you from that, understand that that's a control tactic. And the more you put that in the funnel of loyalty, the more confusion you will experience and the less clarity you will have. That's the first kind of isolation, when someone tries to isolate you. But the second kind of isolation that I think happens a lot in women in destructive marriages is they self-isolate. They stop going out with their friends because their husband doesn't say you can't. But when you do, there is such a price to pay. There's such a, oh, you know, you, oh, you know, we're not enough for you. And you're, you know, you're preferring your friends to me. And what's wrong with our relationship that you need so many girls? You know, this guilt trip and these subtle cuts. And so it's just easier where you feel guilty because you do need outside relationships or you do want to get out of the house or you don't want to be a 24-7 mom and wife that you also want to be a person and a girlfriend and a daughter and, and there's such hassle for doing that, that you start to feel shame or guilt, like something's wrong with me for needing more than just being a my mom and wife. What's wrong with me that I, I'm not content with that? I should be. That's all God made me for, right? No. So we start to self-isolate. I remember talking to a woman, one of my clients who was a doctor, and she could go to work, of course, because she made a lot of money. But if she wanted to do anything else, if she wanted to go to a women's retreat or anything, he didn't say she couldn't. But there was such a hassle about it with who's going to take care of the kids and having to settle everything and the, the silent treatment when she got back. She just didn't. He didn't isolate her. She isolated herself. But other times we isolate ourselves because we're ashamed. We've got bruises on our body. We've got a black eye. Our tooth is knocked out. We were tired of making excuses. We don't let anybody come into our home because our home is got holes in the wall or nothing's fixed or he doesn't pay for any repairs and it looks like a shambles or we don't we don't feel up to it because we feel so depleted we feel so depressed or anxious that we just it's easier to just cut everybody out and so I want to talk about that kind of isolation too because the Bible tells us that we are created for community we are created for conversation we are created for connection and when we don't have that or we only have that with one person and that person is toxic, it takes its toll on you. You know, I wrote a book on depression. And with this, I'll stop and answer some questions. I wrote a book on depression a number of years ago. And um, as I was writing this book, it's called, it was called um, Defeating Depression. Um, the first version was Getting Over the Blues. But as I was working with these women who were depressed, the number one common denominator among all of them was they were in destructive marriages. And that's what began to really wake me up to what, what do we offer these depressed women who are in a horrible marriage? They're told they can't divorce. They have no support. They can't tell anybody. They don't hang out with their girlfriends. They're completely depleted. I had one client who was like on Xanax and vodka in order to be able to have sexual relations with her husbands because her church told her she had to. Is, is that the best we can offer people in these situations? And so God really began to open my eyes that oftentimes depression is a result of interpersonal distress. And the number one common fact or the number one cause for depression, according to the National Institute of Mental Health, in the number of highest category, I'm sorry, of women in depression, according to the National Men, uh, Institute of Mental Health, is unhappily married women. Okay, that says something. So is the pill going to solve that? Now, the pill may help you function. I'm not against antidepressants, but it doesn't solve the problem. And so it's time. It's time to self-isolate. 
you know, stop, stop self-isolating, even if you're depressed. If you're depressed, you need support and encouragement and fresh air more than ever, more than ever. And the only person who's going to take care of you is you. You've got to get out. You've got to get some help. You've got to go to your doctor. You've got to get a girlfriend. You've got to go to Bible study, join Conquer when we open it next week. And so with that, I'm just going to give you an invitation to join our um, webinar next week. We're going to be doing a webinar. Let me put that on the uh, up there to join our webinar so that you can participate and be invited into Conquer. Conquer is our support group where we help women in emotionally destructive marriages. So if you're depressed, you can come there and you can stop isolating. So self-isolation, uh, isolation by others out of the fear of, you know, the enemies out there and the only safe place is here. And you have to believe my, you have to drink my Kool-Aid. And the more you drink that Kool-Aid and you don't have any other water to <laughs> dilute that Kool-Aid, the more toxic it gets in your system, whether it's religious Kool-Aid, political Kool-Aid, interpersonal Kool-Aid. Make sure that you are diluting whatever the mainstream of information you're getting politically, religiously, or interpersonally with other ideas <laughs> that might open your eyes to this Kool-Aid is toxic. All right. All right. Let me just look and see what some of the comments are. And then I'm going to answer some questions if you have about the tactics of isolation. Um, let me just move back through the feed. So hello, everyone. I'm so glad you're here. Yeah, you didn't know about tonight, Janice. I'm glad you're here. Yeah. So we're going to do tonight on marriage counseling. I'm going to give you a couple of really important things. You know, um, this is what the cult of Bill Gothard uses. Laura said that, you know, I was I was at a meeting this last week in Orlando and I was having a conversation with one of my colleagues. She's a, bu a businesswoman and we were just at a business meeting, but she said, I bet you don't know this about me, but I grew up in the Bill Gothard cult. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I do know about that cult. And, it's, it, and it was interesting because my church was very involved in this cult. Um, they weren't like registered members of the, whatever that special organization was, if you did, but that all the kids went to the conferences, except me, because I'm like, no, <laughs> I, don't like, I don't like him. And, um, you know, the families all went and they all wore their long skirts. And, and I'm like, this is weird. I don't, you know, I'm, it's not like you can throw it all out because there's some really good stuff in there, but there's some really bad stuff in there. And the isolation ideas and the um, control over children, as well as adults, women especially, um, just didn't sit well with me, even as a teenager when everybody was into it. Um, and when I was a mom and, you know, we went to this church and all the families were going to the Bill Gothard weekend, I'm like, don't want to go. <laughs> so I totally get it. Yeah, so true, especially when you're in an abusive home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Carrie says, I heard marriage will improve if you just didn't talk on the phone or visit with your friends or watch TV or listen to the radio. <laughs> hey, stop knitting. If you just turned into a robot, or I have this metaphor that we've used a lot on this, is you just turn into a cell phone. You just do what I want you to do. My cell phone is just sitting here quietly, dark. It has no needs of its own until, until um, it, all it needs to do is be plugged in. I don't even wipe it off. It's full of my fingerprints. And, it, you know, it's just going to have to live with that until I get around to it. It doesn't, I don't care about it. I care that it serves me. I don't care about it. And it's an it. And you don't want to be an it in a relationship. You're a person. And if you're not treated like a person, that is... That is a red flag for you. If you're not allowed to have an opinion, that's a red flag for you. If you're not allowed to say, ouch, stop, don't, no, I don't like this. I won't do that. That's not okay with me. You're not allowed to have the freedom to say that without some serious repercussions in your home or even in your church. That's a red flag for you. If you're always defending yourself and you're always explaining yourself and you're always feeling depleted in yourself. That's a red flag for you. And sometimes it's a red flag that you're not taking care of you. You're not taking care of you. And one of the things that we talk about in all of my support groups is that the only person you can work on is you. And it's so tempting to want to change the other person, even to try to change your church leaders, to get them to get it, try to change your husband, to get him to get it. Nobody gets it if they don't want to. 
And sometimes they don't want to because they like the power structure that they have just fine. And they're not wanting to get it. Not that they can't, but that they don't want to. All right. Yeah, Sarah said, I was married to someone like this. I left after four months, divorced after 10 months. I didn't know what was happening, but I knew I wasn't going to put up with it. Question, do they know they are doing it? Is it intentional or does it come from their own insecurity? This is a really good question, Sarah. And it could be both. It could be intentional. Um, you know, that, and often it does, I mean, often an, an abuser is an unhealthy person, okay, for whatever reason. And it can come from their insecurity. I remember, and I think I shared this, I don't know where, but I was one of my very first, uh, not one of my marriage counseling situations. So it was a young couple, just like you were, newly married. They were probably married six months and he was trying to isolate her. And I didn't know all of what I know now, but I knew that that was unhealthy. And she knew it was unhealthy. She was the pastor's wife. The pastor was a friend of mine. He said, you know, say they're newlyweds. They're having some problems. They're having a lot of arguments because, you know, she still wants to hang out with her girlfriends and he's not happy with it. He came from another country. And so he was more like didn't have the friends or the connections in this country. And so he was kind of clinging to her like, you know, as a lifeboat. And she was like, you know, I love you, but, you know, you're kind of smothering me. And um, so was the solution, so here's this really, so that he's insecure. So is the solution, or he's lonely, so is the solution to his problem of insecurity and loneliness on his wife's shoulders? And this is, so his problem is he's a sex addict, whatever the problem is. And, and what typical marriage counseling, we're going to talk about this tonight, but what typical marriage counseling does is make the wife responsible for his solution. And it doesn't work that way. Just like if he were a diabetic and needed to lose weight, you can help him if he wants your help, like cooking healthy, but you can't make him eat healthy. <laughs> you can't make him not eat those Doritos and drink that beer that night. You can't make him. That's not your job. And it's not in your power to do. So when someone is insecure, that's their problem. They're trying to solve their problem by controlling you, right? So if I'm secure and I, if I'm insecure that you might cheat on me or that you're pretty and other guys might look at you or that you will find joy in your girlfriends and that makes me feel insufficient as a man. So I don't want you to hang out with your girlfriends because I want to be your everything. All that kind of craziness is the solution for you to dim your light, just like if you were smarter than your husband intellectually, you pay, got a better paying job, right? And he was a teacher and you were a C, you know, CEO of something. Is the solution to his feelings of inadequacy, even legitimate ones, is the solution to dim your light so that he doesn't feel those feelings? Is that what God would have you do? Hey girl, dim your light. Don't hang out with your friends. Dress really, you know, plain so that he doesn't get threatened by your beauty. Whatever he, his issue is, dim your light, girl. Don't act so smart. Don't take that high paying job. Don't threaten his insecurity. Or is a better solution to say, yeah, I see you're really insecure. What do you want to do about that? This is your problem, not her problem. It's your problem, but it is affecting your marriage. And you're trying to solve your problem by controlling her. And this is where churches, and they wouldn't do it on the opposite side. I just had a woman right now who's, who's um, having a conflict with her destructive husband. And she called me for a consultation. And the whole church is on his side, set boundaries, cut, off, cut her off from the account. So he's supposed to be the man and do all those things. But they would never tell a woman to do that. They tell you to dim your light. And so there's, there's wrong thinking going on in all of that. But I'm so proud of you that you heard straight from the Lord, you knew what you needed to do. And if he knows he's doing it and you tell him, he'll deny it. So you never really know if he knows. If someone knows they're being cruel in their anger, right? They know that. They know that because they don't do it other places. They don't isolate from, you know, everybody from everybody. So it, when they know they do it, they believe they're entitled to do it and they believe they're accurate. Even people who have conspiracy theories or paranoid they know they're doing it. They, know, they may not think they're paranoid. They think they're right, but they know what they're doing. They just believe they're entitled to do it. Okay, so I'm going to go to the question board, which is easier for me than just to scroll through the feed because my assistant Kim is here with me and she kind of goes through the feed and pulls out the questions so I don't have to waste time doing that. Um, I grew up in a house that said our family is against the world and I love that. But my husband has used that against me. 
He gets really jealous when I go out. He says, men are not meant to watch kids. That is on you. So how do I combat this? Well, first of all, he's wrong. So men are parents too. And so his belief is limiting his role as a parent. Now, that's his belief, and you're not going to change his belief. Maybe you could influence it. That's why we get married. People influence us, or we allow them to influence us. That's why we live in community, because people influence us. I just went to a business mastermind for three days. Um, and before that, I was in three days in Orlando for um, AACC, and people influenced me. I heard Ben Carson speak. He was amazing. Um, I heard Janice Parchel, Par Janet Parchel. Parshall speak. She was amazing. You know, people influenced me. They made me think about things. Oh, I didn't think about that before. Oh, I want to do this differently. Oh, at this business meeting, I need to do this differently in order to not have the snags in my business sometimes that I have. So we talk to people and we listen to people in order to be impacted and influenced in that community or connected by them. When your husband is saying men aren't made to, you know, watch children and all that kind of stuff, if you just said, Where'd you get that idea? So if you asked a curious question, where'd you get that idea? I don't see that anywhere in the Bible. You're a parent. As much as I'm a parent, you contributed to making these kids as much as I contributed to making these kids. What makes you think that men are not supposed to watch kids? I see men watching kids all the time. All right. That may invite him to rethink his belief and say, hmm, my dad always said that. So I just thought it was true. Just like, you know, we always cut the turkey in half. And why did you cut the turkey in half? I don't know. My mom always did that. Mom, why did we cut the turkey in half? I don't know. Grandma always cut the turkey in half. Let's ask grandma. Grandma, why did we cut the turkey in half? Because my oven was too small. <laughs> right? That that doesn't apply now. But we never even asked the question, why do we do what we do? So I would invite you to be curious and ask him that question. But if he says, if he agree, if he sticks with his story, men are men not meant to watch kids, that's on you. You're not going to combat this meaning this belief. You can invite him to rethink his belief. But if he's sticking to my story, man, I'm not watching the kids, right? Well, then this isn't how do I change his mind? This is what else can I do so I have more freedom? That might be trading babysitting with other women whose husbands have the same belief that they want to get out too. It might be hiring college kid to watch your kids two days a week. It might be other things that you can do to get the freedom with your girlfriends that you need if your husband's unwilling to watch the kids. You can't make someone do what they won't do. But this is information for you. When you are with a partner who is giving you 100% of the load, it doesn't feel like a partnership. And I think you have to ask yourself, what other ways in our marriage is not a partnership? What other ways does he push things off? Men aren't meant to wash dishes. Men aren't meant to clean the house. Men aren't meant to, you know, say sorry. W what else aren't men supposed to do? So then why are we a partnership? Like, I feel like this is a dictatorship and I'm the slave. You're the master. And that's how it goes. And I don't like it. Right? Because he might like it, but you don't. And this is where I think we have not taken ownership of our life story. We will let someone else form our life story. Like I just have to stay home and watch these kids. He won't let me. And we're angry at the story, but we're not taking ownership of what do we need to do to change it? And not him, but the story, right? There's been lots of bad guys in stories. Think about Elsa and Anna and Frozen or, you know, the gladiator. There's lots of stories and there's always bad guys in the stories and there's always obstacles. But what does the person in the story do? They get over those obstacles. They figure out solutions to those obstacles. They don't just sit and give in to them. They might for about 30 seconds, but then they move on. So I would encourage you to figure out a solution to your problem. I want to get out more, and my husband is unwilling to watch our children. So what's the solution to your problem? Plus, you have a husband who's maybe stuck in a lot of mindsets that are making you pretty miserable. All right. I have questioned and doubted myself in my relationship. This makes so much sense. How do I know when it's my exaggerating or a real abusive situation? Is there a way that I can stay in the right mindset? I think one of the most powerful ways that we can stay in the right mindset is to talk to others. So, so I might say, oh, I'm such a failure. I can't believe I, I bombed that test, right? 
I bombed that test. I, I feel horrible. And, you know, if I were to say that all by myself, that's my story. I'm sticking with it. But if I were to share that with a friend and they'd say to you, well, what do you mean? You're a smart person. What happened? Oh, I, you know, I got a, you know, I got a B minus and that's just not okay with me. And she, that now we're putting it in perspective. Wait a minute. You said you bombed the test. You didn't bomb the test. Maybe you didn't ace the test, but you didn't bomb the test. All right. So now I'm getting perspective from other people. Maybe I go to my professor and say, I really feel horrible. I bombed this test. And he'd say, you know, you didn't bomb the test. You got this part all perfect, but this part you don't get, you, you're not understanding this concept yet because these are all the answers you got wrong. So I'd really encourage you to really study this part of the test because this is the part you don't understand. The rest of it you got, you would have gotten an A on, right? So as you talk to people about what you're thinking, you know, like, okay, so last night my husband, um, forced me to do something sexually that I don't want to do. Does that ever happen to you? No, never, never. I've been married to, you know, so I remember talking to a client who um, her husband uh, called her the B word and her uh, father called her mother the B word and her grandfather, who was a pastor, called his wife the B word. So to her, that was really normal. Like, of course, men call their wives witches with a B. Um, and so she, she was telling me this, she goes, this is normal, you know? And I, and I said, it's not normal in my house. No, your husband's never called you that. I said, he's probably thought it, but he's never called me it, no, ever. Not ever, i have been married maybe 30 years at the time, never. I wouldn't put up with it. And he knows I wouldn't put up with it. So no, he's never called me that, even if he's thought it. I can't believe that. So she asked him and um, he said, no. So I think that's the best way to get some perspective. If you are exaggerating, like I bombed my test, my life is over and it may not be true. Um, and to get some perspective or, you know, this probably happens to everyone. It happened to my family. It happened to my mom's family. It happened to my grandparents. It's probably normal and it's not normal. Right. And so to be able to, that's why isolation can be so toxic because nobody can think truthfully all by themselves. We need that feedback. We need that light. Hebrews 3.13 says, let us encourage one another. One another. We can't isolate. Let us encourage one another day after day, lest any one of us become hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So the deceitfulness of sin, whether it's sinful thoughts in our own heart, like I'm entitled, I'm entitled, I'm entitled or sinful thoughts of someone else's sin. You're a loser, you're a loser, you're worthless, you're not worth anything, you can't do anything, you're just a woman. And we become hardened to that reality when it's not true. It's not true. And that's why the Bible warns us not to isolate. We need community, we need connection. Ephesians 4 says, or 5 says, do not, partip do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Well, who do you expose them to if you're in isolation? Nobody. And so you expose them to people. Why? Because you get clarity. Is this really darkness or are my eyes just cloudy? And they're going to go, this is really darkness. Or I think you're overreacting and you get perspective that way. And I wouldn't just ask one people person, but I'd ask a number of trusted people to get some perspective on things. All right. What do we do as wives when our Christian husband mocks us, even when we told them we hate it? So I might ask them a curious question. <clears throat> so, so this was my policy. If someone disrespected my boundary two times, three times, I stopped asking them to respect my boundary because they already told me by their actions that they weren't. So if someone makes fun of you and you say, stop it, I don't like that. Most people who are healthy and want to be in a relationship with the other person would say, oh my God, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. You know, my family is always sarcastic and it sort of comes out of my mouth. If I ever do it again, you know, call me on it. I don't want to be like that for you, right? That's what a healthy person would respond. Obviously, your husband's not. So you've told him, I don't like it. Stop it. Don't do it. And he keeps doing it. So I would say to him this. It's a curious question. You have to be in the right frame of mind. So if you ask it in a snarky way, he'll just mock you. But this is the question you say to him. 
I've asked you, I'm curious, can I ask you a question? Okay, go ahead. I've asked you to stop this a couple times. It's really um, disrespectful to me when you make fun of me, especially in front of people. I don't like it at all, and I've told you that. What do you get out of it that you keep doing it? Okay. Now, this is an opportunity, not necessarily a done deal. This is an opportunity for him to reflect on himself. Wow. Why am I still doing it? Right? That will give you some light for you on whether or not he's open or closed, whether he's teachable or not, and whether you have a voice in his life. So far, you don't, because when you say stop, don't, ouch, I don't like it, he's ignoring you. But when you stop and ask the question, why are you ignoring me? What's going on that I don't have, you know, whatever I say don't, doesn't matter to you? What does that mean for our marriage? And if you ask it in a humble, curious way, it might offer him a moment of, oh, I sound like a louse. <laughs> you know? um, and maybe he's okay with that, or maybe he's not. But it will give you the next insight into what you have to do. So if he says, I don't know why, you know, it's just a habit, and I didn't think it was that big of a deal, or I don't really care what you think. And he doesn't say it that, obviously he's not going to say it that way, but he might. So now you have clarity. Is he immature and is he willing to do some work on that? Or is he just treating you like a cell phone and he doesn't really care whether you're dirty or you're, I yell at my cell phone. <laughs> it's not working. The other day when I was trying to do something here, it wasn't working. And I'm like, why are you working? You know, and I didn't care how it felt. I didn't even think about how it felt. Right? It wasn't working. And so that will give you some clarity about what your next step is. I would highly encourage you to join our webinar next week. Our webinar will be one hour long. Um, I highly encourage you to join it live because even in the Facebook page, this is my public Facebook page, so be careful you know, what you write on here. But in our webinar, we will be on a private chat. And so even not being isolated, but hearing from other women and saying, okay, this is what happened. Does, is this normal? And they're all, you get 50 comments, no, or 500 comments, N-O with big old capital N-O. Now you've got some perspective, right? You're not being so isolated and you'll have the opportunity to ask those questions. So the webinar is about how long should you keep trying? So let's say you ask this curious question, like, what do you get out of doing this to me when I've told you I don't like it? You've asked a curious question and now you'll know the next step based on how he responds. But how, so let's say he responds, oh, I never thought about that. You're right. Or I don't know, you know, something. He doesn't just shut you down. I don't know. Well, I'd like to think about it because this is hurting our relationship. Okay. And then what happens next? And what happens next? So how long do you keep trying those kind of things? And how do you know when you're just casting your pearls before swine? How do you? So I'm going to teach you how to know that in a, in a clear way, in a kind of a roadmap kind of way so that you can gain and grow in your discernment. So how long do you keep trying? And when do you know changes are really happening or not? And I'm going to make that crystal clear in an hour long webinar, we're gonna have slides, I'm gonna have a handout for you to take notes. And afterwards, we're, I am going to invite you if you want some further help to join Conquer. Conquer is our membership group. It's only open twice a year. So a lot of you are on our wait list to join Conquer. We're going to open those doors. Um, but I want you to be at the webinar because that's where you will get some support. You'll get some sense of community. You will get a sense of, oh my gosh, fresh information, fresh air into some wrong church teaching about the role of a wife and how God sees you. And I'm going to say it a little differently than you've heard it before. So I highly encourage you, but you can't come if you don't sign up. All right. And a lot of people are busy these days. I totally get it. I'm busy too. I, I, there was a webinar last night that I wanted to go to and I signed up for it. And she said, oh, you don't have to attend live. If you don't have, you know, have time, you can watch a replay. I'm going, I'm going good. <laughs> I'll sign up because I'll watch it today because I was on an airplane. I couldn't watch it. But this is a little different. We will give you an abbreviated webinar replay if you sign up and you can't attend, but we're giving you two places to attend at noon on Wednesday, next Wednesday, and at 7.30, just like today, noon and 7.30 p.m. 
Live is very different because you don't get the question and answer time in the replay. You don't get the opportunity to hear other people say their stuff and say, oh my gosh, my life is the same way. What are the answer to that? I learned something. So a live is so much better for you if you're in this situation. So if you're just, you know, curious about that, if you're a counselor or something and you want to watch a webinar, you can watch it on a replay. That's fine. But if you're in this situation yourself, come live next Wednesday, noon Eastern time. I'll speak for an hour. I will um, teach for an hour just like this on a, a slideshow. I'll be on the side and my slideshow will be going. We'll share with some real information, a roadmap on how do you know? How can you discern? So I went this way and then this happened. How would I know if we're making progress or is this a roadblock? How will I know? So I'm going to share that information with you. And then I'm going to uh, share with you. All right. If you're here, what do you do? If you're here, what do you do next? And how do you do it? And that's going to take about an hour. And then I'm going to open it up to questions. And I'm going to invite you to join Conquer um, because we open our doors. It'll only be open for a week. We shut them again for six months because we have a lot of women waiting to join and we will be busy welcoming you all and helping you get access to the community, to the connection, and to the content. We have a lot of content in Conquer that is not public. So I mark your calendar, sign up for the webinar, and please plan to attend live. It'll make a big difference, especially if you're in the situation or you know someone who is. All right. My ex used to get angry and mock me when I'd come home after a support group meeting. What are some ways that I could have respectively responded to comments like that? Um, you know, the Bible says two things about mockers in Proverbs. If you read, it says, you know, if you try to correct a mocker, you're just going to get mocked some more. And then other times it says, you know, correct a mocker for his mocking. So I think it's saying you never know what's going to come when you mock, correct a mocker. So what I would say to him is the same thing I said to the other person. I might ask a curious question and like, what's this about? I find this helpful. And why is it that you feel a need to mock me? Would you mock me if I came home from the doctor? I mean, I don't understand what this is about. So that might be something. So I wouldn't, after you've said, stop mocking me. And, and, and so I would just say, you know what? This is something that is good for me. And not sure why you feel such a need to put it down. Right. So you're standing strong on your truth or on what you need. And this is really important, ladies. How do I say this? I think so often I need you to be OK with what I'm doing for me. Right. And you don't you don't need him to be OK. You might like him to be OK. Yay! you went to your support group. I'm so proud of you. That would be lovely. Right. But if you obviously don't need it because you're still going. Right. But if I need you to tell me I'm doing the right thing in order for me to keep doing the right thing for me, then I'm unhealthy, right? So I don't need my husband to say, so proud of you that you got a good night's sleep last night or good job for eating healthy or good job for walking 12,000 steps a day. Or, I don't need him to do that. He might do that or he might mock me for that. Ugh, you're, such a, you're such a lazy person. You need so much sleep like eight hours of sleep or, you know, why are you always exercising so much? You think you're so hot. You know, you're not hot. You're flabby as ever. <laughs> I mean, they could say those things. He could. And, and I wouldn't like it, but it wouldn't stop me from doing what I'm going to do. I probably wouldn't live with them either, but um, that's just me. Um, but what I'm saying to you is if you're doing things that are good for you and someone else is mocking you, you know, we have a lot of, and all we have to do is look at Politically, we have a lot of bleacher people who are looking at others and being the critic, whether you're in the stands and criticizing the quarterback or whether you're in the stands and criticizing the government or whoever. It's easy to do nothing with your life and critique everybody else's. And that's not our job. Our job is to get going with our life. And I would encourage you to not get caught up in trying to get him to do something different. But you continue your work. You do it and just say to him, you know what? That is your problem. I love my support group and I'm going to continue to go. And if you, if he sees that it doesn't work to either engage you in a crazy making gaslighting conversation, or it doesn't work to get you to stop going, or it doesn't work to get you to beg him for support, he might just stop on his own because it's not fun for him anymore if it doesn't work, right? There's something about this that, that's fun for him. Um. My husband says, I get all my happiness from you. I don't need outside friends. 
And then he gets mad when I tell him I need some girlfriend time. How can I explain this without making it sound like he's not enough? He's not enough. <laughs> he's just not enough. <laughs> so here's what you have to say. This is really important. For those of you who are newly married, you need to say this really quick. If you suspect any of this, like there's no me here, uh, just we, and it's really you. <laughs> All right. So this is what, there's no me here. And so you need to establish an I, me. All right. And this is how you're going to do it. You're going to start saying to him, well, you know, that's up to you if you don't need any friends besides me, but that's not me. I need girlfriends. I've always had a lot of girlfriends. You're my husband, but you're not my girlfriend. It's different. I have different needs met from my girlfriends than I have met from you. Maybe you don't need that, but I need that. All right. That would be one way of saying it. Same way. Well, you might not need to eat healthy. You might, your body might feel fine eating meals of Doritos and chicken nuggets, but my body needs vegetables. My body needs to eat healthy. And I need to have vegetables in the house in order for my body to function. So I'm going to make sure that we have vegetables at the table. You might not like Indian food, but I really like Indian food. And so once in a while, I'm going to have some Indian food. And whether I have to order takeout, if you don't want to go to an Indian restaurant, that's all right. But I'm going to eat Indian food and you're on your own for dinner tonight. Or I'm going to go to Indian food with my girlfriends who like Indian food. So here's where the me has to be clear, not putting him down. We are different. You are you. I am me. And that is the beginning of healthy, respectful relationship. And I'm just going to take those of you who are moms back to mommy. All right. So studies show, psychological studies show that when an infant is born, it doesn't see himself as a me, you, or she doesn't see herself as a you, me relationship because she was inside of you. She's, it's just us. <laughs> It's just us. And when the baby is a baby, she's not capable. She's immature. She's not capable of that yet. She's not capable of differentiation between you and me. So all she's thinking about is me. Wah, wah, wah. I don't care if it's two o'clock in the morning. Wah, wah, wah. She's not thinking about you needing sleep. It's not in her, <laughs> it's not in her maturity levels at all at that stage. But if she were 12 and doing the same, you would say she was sick. There was something wrong with her, right? Because at that point, she should say, well, mommy's doing something else. I have to wait. But even not at 12, but at two, this starts to happen. And we notice this happening as a child begins to... So so you're feeding the baby and this I, it's called a transitional object. So the baby needs comfort. Mommy's always there, always there. Mommy's not there. What do I do? All of a sudden, I'm meeting my own need. I've got my blankie. I'm comforting myself. I'm separate from mommy. I don't always have mommy to help me calm down. I got to calm myself down. Now, this is not in their words, but it's developing in their psyche. And then when they get to be about two years old, guess what? A child starts setting boundaries with their mother. How do you know? They develop a little word called no. <laughs> No, I'm not doing that. I'm different than you, mommy. You might want me to eat peas, but I'm not eating peas. Mm -mm, mm -mm, I'm not opening my mouth. You might want me to come, but I'm not coming. I'm going here. This is healthy. It's frustrating as heck, but it's healthy because now they're saying, I'm different than you. So when you marry a man who wants to merge with you in a smothering, controlling kind of way, and you allow that because you think this is oneness and this is a healthy marriage. It's not. So this is where you have to pull back and you can still be loving and respectful, especially if there's not a lot of damage happened yet. That's why the young people need to do this. And you need to say, you know, it might be fine for you to have no friends, but it's not fine for me. We're different. And part of having a good marriage is accepting that they're different. You know, you might like sushi. I don't like sushi. And I'm not going to stop you from eating sushi, but please don't make me eat it. Right. And so these are the things that were compromise and consideration and care for the differences of how you function are. And if you never speak up because you think I have to submit to everything, it just grows the monster of we is really me. You need to feel like I feel I don't need friends. Why do you need friends? Because I'm different than you. Right. You don't have to try to convince him he needs friends. Of course he does. But you don't have to convince him of that. But you do need to convince him 
or at least stand up for yourself and say, maybe you don't need them, but I need them. Maybe you don't think you need vegetables. Of course you need vegetables, but you're not going to change it, but I need them. Maybe you don't need to go to the doctor, but I need to go to the doctor. Maybe you don't need support groups, but I need support groups. And I'm going to do what I need to be a healthy, godly person and do it. All right. He's not enough. Marriage. Let me say one more thing. Fantasy of Hollywood and Harlequin is you're going to find a soulmate and they're going to complete you. It's not true. There is no one who completes you, but Jesus, there is no one who completely completes you, but God. And so when we're constantly looking for someone else to complete us and fulfill us and make us happy, they're going to always fail because they can't, they can't. And so when we have those expectations they are unrealistic. My husband is intimacy anorexic. We just learned the name in July. He married 17 years. He refused to recover. We are separated, living together. We have four kids still at home. Is there any hope for us? No. I'll just be really straight. There is no hope for you because he doesn't want help. All right? Just like if someone's diagnosed with diabetes and he refuses to take his blood levels and he refuses to eat right or she, you know, either one, they're going to die early. They're going to die early. If someone refuses treatment, I have a friend who just got diagnosed with um, high blood pressure and they didn't want to take medication. The doctor said, it's your choice, but let me show you what's going to happen. And they just gave them some illustrations of the death rates of people with high blood pressure and strokes, possibilities. And they said, hmm, I think I will take some medicine, right? So no, there's no hope for anybody to get better if they're not willing to admit they're sick and get the proper treatment. And your husband's not willing to do that. So here's what you have to do. You have to come to a place of acceptance of that. I'm not saying like it. It's just like, you know, when my mother decided that she didn't want to have any more medical care and that she was ready to go to see Jesus, my dad didn't like it, but he had to accept it. You're the boss of you. I'm not the boss of you. You know how much pain you're in. You know how much medical treatment has wore you out. And it's a lot, you're allowed to call the shots about this part of your life because it's your life, right? I don't like it, but I accept it. I accept it. And we're going to call hospital and all the things that you do. So I'm not saying that you like his decision. I'm not getting recovery, but now you have to go to the next step. All right. So I accept that you don't want to get help. Where does that leave us? Are we like in the parent role now? We have four children. Are we going to just stay separated? Are we eventually going to get divorced after? Because I don't want to live like this. If you don't want to get help, we don't really have a marriage. We don't really have a relationship. So I accept you don't want to get help, but let's plan for the future. Are we going to parent together? Are we going to divorce and, you know, parent well and try to get our kids through this? What's our next step? Because if you don't want to get better, just like if someone says, I want to, you know, I want to die. Okay, what's my next step? How do I get my life insurance policies? I get it, do what I need to do, <clears throat> right? And so I think sometimes we're not willing to be respectfully accepting of someone else's decision because we don't like it. My dad didn't like my mom's decision, but he accepted it and she died. And he's having to live with out her now. And she's feeling a whole lot better, I'm sure, but he's not. And But he gave her the right to choose because that's what you do when you love someone. <clears throat> my husband doesn't seem to validate my emotions and thoughts and remains emotionally distant despite marriage counseling for nine months. How long do I wait for a change? Well, <clears throat> I think you need to define the change you're looking for. So are you looking for him to validate your emotions? And so then again, the question becomes, hey, we've been in marriage counseling for nine months. I'm not feeling a whole lot of progress. Are you? No. Okay. So Let's define the change that you want. Like, why are you going there? I'm going there because you're making me. All right, well, you're released. I don't want you to go to marriage counseling if you have no interest in improving our marriage. So I'm really unhappy in our marriage. I, I'm, I'm desperately unhappy in our marriage. And that doesn't seem to matter to you. So where do you want to go from here? I think we need to have those honest, tough conversations. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I can't tell you the number of men who have called me after their wife has left and said, okay, I'm just not willing to live like this anymore. So if you don't want to get help and you don't want to change and you think what you're doing is fine, I'm not going to change that. I accept that, but I'm not willing to stay married like that. Whether you want to watch porn, whatever it is, the deal breakers, we're not talking because you won't pick up your socks. We're talking about deal breakers. Okay. Um, then I, I'm not, I'm not doing this like this anymore. So you don't want to change. You don't want to get help. I accept that. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, let's go to lawyers and do what we need to do. And and I'm not saying this for trivial things. I'm talking about deal breaker, breaking trust, breaking trust, unfaithfulness, repeated unfaithfulness. I'm not willing to change. I'm not willing to get help. And I'm not, I'm not just talking about sticking someone's penis in someone else's vagina. I'm talking about 
pornography, all that. Continued unfaithfulness, no repentance. Continued indifference, no repentance. Continued abuse, no repentance. Continued deceit, no, no repentance. A continued dependence, like a child, like you're taking care of a, a child who's unwilling to mature and grow up. I don't want to have to clean the house. I, don't, I just want to play video games all day, mom. I want you to take care of me, work hard, clean the house, take care of the kids, and let me do my one thing. Why would you enable that? Why would you enable that under the guise of marriage? It's not a marriage. And so have that hard conversation. So here's the secret. So many men have called me after you've done that, emailed me, called me, and said, I never thought she'd leave me. I just always thought that because God says he hates divorce, she would never pull that trigger. And so I could just get away with whatever I wanted to get away with because there were no boundaries and no consequences. So friend, your work, and that's what we do in Conquer, is to help you establish what are your boundaries and what are your consequences. Because you have mostly zero power over changing them. You have a little influence, maybe, but zero power over changing anybody, even your kids, even your kids. You can be the best parent. You can teach your kid. You can pay for counseling. You can pay for private lessons and tutoring, you can't make them learn. You can't make them study. You can't make them be honest. You can't make them. You can just create some boundaries and consequences that make those choices more likely, but not guaranteed. All right. So quit putting that on your shoulders that somehow if you were the best parent or you were a better wife, or if you could figure it all out and do the right things to say, you could change someone. Even Jesus couldn't change Judas, didn't change Judas. Even Jesus didn't change the Pharisees. Even Jesus had a conversation with the rich young ruler and the rich young ruler walked away and he let him. And it says, and he looked at him and loved him and let him go. You cannot have a relationship with someone who does not want to have a relationship. They might want to sponge off of you or live off of you or control you or abuse you, but they cannot have a relationship with you if they don't do certain healthy things that make a relationship possible. All right. How do I break out of self-induced isolation at church? I don't want to be fake, so I've been keeping myself because my family is falling apart. Hubby isolates himself due to mental health trauma addiction, which has resulted in me grieving for over a decade about our marriage. I've struggled to be a good mom when solo for 10 years, four kids, trying to get, grow, move on, but so, so hard. So first of all, I would encourage you, and I'm going to encourage you to join Conquer uh, next week. This is an amazing support group for you. It's an amazing support group. I've been doing Conquer for seven years now. We have a lot of people in Conquer. And there are some amazing, uh, godly, wise women who just are where you are. And some of them have chosen to stay well for a season because of their kids. Some of them have needed to leave. And there are some of them still aren't sure what they're doing. They're still discerning. But they have support around them. They have a place to go. They can type in the Conquer Facebook page. I need prayer. I'm sinking. I need help. You know, pray for me. Or, you know, uh, you know, I need to find a job. You know, where would I go? I never apply, applied for a job online before. How does that? And you have all kinds of questions that you can ask and people to support you and love on you and be there for you. And I would just encourage you to do that. But you don't have to. There's other ways to do that. But that's probably the easiest way for you because it's anonymous in some ways. You're not having to see those people every Sunday, right? You're in a support group from women from all over the world, basically. But I would say you're going to have to, churches are very weird these days, but they were weird before COVID too. And I, I, I was in the same church for a long time and I felt lonely and isolated. I think people kind of are busy and they aren't connecting like they should and they aren't connecting like we need. And even in our local churches, um, if you're in a small group, that would be a good thing for you to be celebrate recovery or um, maybe a betrayal addiction group that's in your community if there is one for you know wives of sex addicts those kind of things um, but I think you need to start being honest with people and when I say honest I'm not saying transparent so if I'm honest I'm gonna say hey I've got my pickleball clothes on and I'm honest I'm you know just as I'm dressed but I'm not like taking off all my clothes and being honest. Right? <laughs> There's a certain boundaries that we have, even in honesty. So I'm not being inauthentic. I'm being honest, but I'm not being naked. 
So I think we can be honest with people at church if if we have relationships. We just can't go. I mean, maybe you can go up to your pastor and say, hey, I need to talk to you. I'm not doing so well. That would be honest. Now, you haven't taken off all your clothes in front of him, but you're going to see if he cares. Or you're going to, you know, maybe have, if you have some girlfriends in church, what if you just said to them, I really need to do lunch with, with you know, somebody or have breakfast with someone. Um, is anybody available next week? And that's honest. I'm vulnerable. I'm sharing a need. I need to connect. You're not saying, I need my husband. You're not going into all that because you don't know if these people are really going to be invested in you. But if they are and they go to lunch with you or your pastor talks to you, then I think you can say the next step, not my husband's an addict and he's a narcissist and he's a jerk and I don't know what to do, but I'm having a real struggle at home and I need prayer. And maybe that's all you need to say because you don't want to say anything more. It's your decision how naked you get, right? Some of us get way too naked way too early in our relationships and we regret it. We're like embarrassed. Like, oh my gosh, I just shared my whole life story at small group and I don't know these people very well. And so I don't know if I can trust him with all that information. I've sexually abused a giant. We, we shouldn't share all that. You don't sleep with someone on the first date, I hope. <laughs> God tells you not to for safety reasons, not just physical safety, but emotional safety reasons. And we don't take off all of our emotional clothes on the first date when we have a, a new friend. But you start sharing honestly and authentically. So even with your children, you don't want to take off all your clothes in front of your children and say the dirt about their dad. They love their dad. But you can be honest without being naked. And so here's a couple of examples. Let's say that your kid sees you crying after a fight with your husband. What's wrong, mom? Oh, nothing. Just got an onion. I was cutting onions. <laughs> it's not true. It's not true. And they sort of know it, but then they create a story in their head, like mom's having a nervous break. They don't know what's going on. And if you live in a toxic home, your husband may feed that if you don't give your children the truth. So dad and I had a fight and I'm upset. What'd you fight about? That's not your business, but I'm upset. So you can have boundaries. It's not your business. You're the kid. I'm the adult. Adults fight sometimes. And you can have a boundary. No, you don't get to know, but I just want you to know why I'm upset. Right? Or, you know, I'm, um, I would say in front of my kids, if my husband doesn't treat me well, I don't like the way dad treats me. You know, if he does it in front of them, I would just say that. I would just say it in front of him. I, I don't like the way you treat me. I told you that before. And I especially don't like you doing it in front of the kids. So now he's on notice that you're not going to treat this as normal behavior, and you're being honest with your children that things aren't going so well, the older they get especially, so that they're not shocked if someday you say, I'm done. Like, what's wrong with you, mom? You've put up with it all these years. Why would you ruin our family now? Why would you spring that on your kids at 22 when they had no idea? And it's been going on for 22 years, right? So give them inklings. Give your family some inklings. I could use some prayer. Things aren't going so well at home. What's going on? Well, I don't really want to go into the details. Just like I say, this is our public Facebook page. You don't need to go into all the details. I know why you're here, all right? But so guard yourself in terms of all the details, but you can be honest in life is hard and I'm struggling and I could use some support and prayer and don't isolate. There's a lot of shame around a lot of the details and maybe that would help give you some boundaries. Just like if I were to get naked, I would feel a lot of shame over bulges and flabs that, you know, plus just being naked in front of strangers would be embarrassing. I would never go to a nudist camp. Well, some people would, I wouldn't. Um, and so there's a lot of shame in being totally naked. Um, good shame, bad shame, depending on your mindset. But there is shame in getting totally naked. You don't have to with everybody. Only really, really trusted people. That's why God says, don't be sexually intimate before you're in a safe and trusting relationship, marriage. And that's why when that safe and trusting relationship, marriage, is shattered, the sexual relationship is so hard because you don't have any intimacy. And it feels like you're just a body to be used. And that doesn't feel good. And the church doesn't address that. So we're addressing that here. And we talk a lot about that in Concord. So I would encourage you, if you haven't yet, sign up for the webinar, leslieburnick.com forward slash join webinar. I'm going to answer a few more questions. A friend's husband is very concerned about the pandemic and isolates his wife. How far should she comply with this? They both live in the same house, so she feels she must comply. You know, I understand if he wasn't this way before the pandemic, if he wasn't controlling before, 
um, I might give him a little latitude. If this is just another piece to add on, then she's going to have to have some boundaries. And she may still decide to have some boundaries. Like, I know this is really concerning for you. I can't stand living like this. So how can we compromise in a way that would feel safe for you and still I can breathe? All right. So this is part of marriage, whether it's about the pandemic, finances, child care, am I going to work or not work? All the things that you might argue about. There's this topic out here, whatever it is, sex topic, finance topic, kids topic, COVID topic, whatever. And then there's this process in the relationship in which we talk about solving this problem. So if it's always the solution is my way or the highway, if that's the pattern, then there really isn't mutuality and reciprocity and freedom in this relationship to say, that doesn't work for me, right? So if you have a problem out there in a marriage, together you're supposed to solve this problem in a way that's a win-win for both people. So how can I go out and do what I need to do and still make it feel safe for you here versus I don't have a voice, I don't have a choice. So, so let me say this again. I'm going to see if I can draw it for you because I think this is important. Let me see if I can find an eraser. Um, I can't. So I'm going to get a piece of paper and do it that way on my dry board. I, oh, goodness. All right. So if, if you've got two people, so we're just going to put husband, wife, and there's a problem here. Ideally, the husband and the wife are working together on the problem and their relationship is good. So they're not beating each other up in the problem, right? But how you solve this problem has to have compromise from both perspectives. And so the problem in this instance is COVID, but I would say for this woman, look at all the problems that you have in life. And if the problems are typically, I solve the problem and you submit to whatever I want versus we look at the problem about how to best raise our kids, how to best handle our finances, how to best handle COVID, um, how to best save for retirement, how to best decorate a house, whatever. Or maybe even the problem is, hey, you're really good at that. You decide and I'll defer, which is my husband and I, you know, he's very techy. So I'm like, I don't know, you do it. You know, I don't know which camera to buy. I don't even care. I don't even care about cars. Buy whatever car you want. I don't, you know, as long as it's in this price range, that's my input. I don't care what color it is. I don't, you know, I don't care. So, so sometimes you have that, but if both of you care, he cares about safety and COVID, you care about freedom and COVID. How do you work together on this problem so that you are respecting each other's concerns, but he's not got all the power and you have all the, you know, submitting. And I think this is a really crucial aspect that we don't really talk about that. So this is what happens. So when you try to solve the problem, if this part of the relationship starts to get fractured, like I resent him because he's not letting me out of the house. I resent him because I don't have any control over the finances. I resent him because he's putting me down in front of the kids. And so we, we, we don't have a good problem solving process. And we stop talking about the problem, right? It's not the problem. It's this. How come I don't get a voice? How come you don't hear me when I say no? What's going on that when I tell you I don't like you mocking me, you continue to mock me? You know, so then the, 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 the issue that we talk about is not the money or the COVID or anything, but how come I don't get a, an equal decision making power in this relationship? How come it's always your way or the highway, right? So now you're talking about the relationship and the effects of your problem solving methods on the relationship. And I would also venture to say that if you were to get some personal coaching or counseling and you were to look at the patterns of how we solve problems in our marriage, how do we address problems? How do we talk about them? You'll see the same song, different verse. The different verse is the problem. The same song is the way we do it, all right? And so what has to change is the way we do it because we can't even talk about finance. We can't even talk about sex. We can't even talk about that without causing a lot of friction between us. Well, then that's the problem. We can't talk, not the problem itself or your marriage isn't going to make it, all right? Um, let's see. Two weeks ago, my husband and I went to a Christian marriage retreat. 
prior to that divorce had come in the picture. I believe he's a covert narcissist and this has been really a big issue. At the retreat, I felt like such a failure, but on the way home, he stayed, started a fight and thought of a failure and, and the thought of failure went out the window. I feel so confused. <laughs> so I would say, for those of you who are in this situation, I don't know what happened at the retreat. I don't have enough information to comment, but I, I, you shouldn't feel like a failure. When you see your sin or you see ways that you fell short or whatever, I mean, that's an opportunity for you to say, wow, like when I was at this business retreat, you know, I saw lots of places where I could do better. You know, I could do better. I'm not a failure. I have pretty good business, but I could do better, right? I could, I could tweak this or I could see where I didn't even do this. So it's not a failure. So I think mindset is really important, how you look at feedback and how you look at correction when you go to things like this so that you can grow and learn versus just shame yourself and feel like a loser, which is where you're at. Um, but I think there's, for women that I work with, and you know, you're here, so I'm inviting you to work with us and conquer, we tend to focus on demonizing and diagnosing our husband. So he's a covert narcissist, right? That's what I think. And so therefore, I put him in these boxes and everything he does. Like if someone says, Leslie, you're a liberal or whatever, you know, woman's liber, it doesn't matter really what I say anymore because they already categorized me. And so everything I say will be put into that category. So I think we have to be careful. Um, you're not a psychologist. You know, you don't have the tools to diagnose someone any more than you would diagnose them medically and saying, I think you have lung cancer. They might have all the symptoms of that, but you can't diagnose them unless you're qualified to diagnose somebody. So I would be careful about diagnosing or demonizing anyone. What I would say is describe his behavior, what's okay with you and what's not okay with you. And so this goes back to doing your own work and saying, okay, how do I want to show up in this relationship? And when he's acting in this, these ways, instead of focusing, oh, he's a car wreck narcissist, you know, when he shows up in this way, when he undermines me, when he mocks me, when he lies to me, when he shines his image for everyone to look at how wonderful he is and stabs me in the back behind behaviors of a covert narcissist, okay? Instead of describing him, even if you go to counseling, if you say, oh, he's a covert narcissist, actually, you're going to be like one notch down in the counselor's mind because they're thinking, all right, you've already demonized your husband. You're not qualified to diagnose him. So the better thing to do is describe his behaviors. When So you started this fight on the way home. What's, all that, what's that all about? I don't like that. This isn't healthy for me. I'm not willing to do this. And this is what we do a lot in Conquer, is we help you move from, and, and there's a stage of diagnosing and demonizing. I, I understand that because you can't wake up until you say, oh my gosh, I'm in a boiling hot pot of hot water, right? And so something's wrong. And so there's a stage of that. But if you stay stuck there and try to convince everybody of what your husband is, you're going to lose. You're going to lose if you do it that way. So our goal is for you to say, I don't like this, this meaning his behaviors, right? So if someone has, if someone's chasing you with a knife and it's because they're an abuser and a, a sociopath, or they're changing, chasing you from a knife because they have paranoid schizophrenia, or they're chasing you with a knife because they've got a brain tumor pressing another frontal lobe, the imp or, you know, the impact for you is the same. If you let them stab you, you're going to get hurt. The diagnosis is important to him. It's less important to you if you're fighting for your life or your sanity, right? And so what's really important is for you to say, when someone chases me with a knife, I can't live with them. I can't live with them. Even if I feel compassion that they've got a brain tumor or I feel compassion that they've got mental health issues, I can't, I can't live that. It's not safe for me and the kids if he's running around the house with a knife, threatening to kill everybody, right? So I would say move off of the diagnosis and move much more clear on what behaviors are unacceptable to you. What behaviors can you tolerate? Can you not tolerate? And we all have to tolerate certain behaviors that we don't like, right? So we all have habits and quirks in our life. And that's why God says there's two things. There's forbearance. He says, put up with one another, put up with one another's faults. So you are married to an imperfect person who's not going to do everything right as I am. And they're married to us. <laughs> so we're not going to do everything right either. That doesn't mean you feel like a loser. You're just a human being. Of course, you're not going to do everything right. You're not capable of doing everything right. And you have weaknesses and you have faults and you have sins and we all have them. So I think the part of you maturing and you getting healthy, which is what we work on a lot in Conquer, is for you to start to find you. Like, who am I? What's important to me? What do I stand for? 
What do I stand against? So part of setting boundaries is setting your identity. Who am I? I like this. I don't like this. Just like Arizona likes people to, you know, doesn't like it, but allows people to carry guns in their pocket if they want to. They carry a gun on their belt if they want to. New York City, we don't do that here. Chicago, we don't do that here. Interesting that Chicago has a lot of gun deaths, but <laughs> that's, their, that's who they are. That's what they stand for. That's what they stand against. And we're different. We're different. Arizona is not the same as Chicago or Illinois, right? Different rules, different laws. So, so boundaries help establish identity. We help you do that and conquer. And then we help you establish responsibility. Who are you? What are you responsible for? So you're responsible for you, your thoughts, your mind, your safety, your integrity, the way you show up in life, your story. And how do you do that when someone is constantly aggravating you and challenging you and mocking you and lying about you and cheating on you and putting you down? How do you do that? It's not about trying to change them so they don't do that. That's where a lot of church teaching, marriage counseling, and and books get women in trouble because you are such hard workers. <laughs> you will try hard, hard, hard. And it gets you nowhere because it's not possible for you to change another person. And so we want to just give you a completely different approach. How do I become the person I'm proud of? Even if he still mocks me, people mocked Jesus, didn't they? People didn't like Jesus and he was Jesus. So you're going to have some naysayers in your life and it might be your husband or your mother-in-law. And so how do you stand strong in who you are and like who you are? Not perfect, but like who you are and who you're becoming. How do you show up in a way that you're proud of? And when you're in danger, whether it's physical danger, sexual danger, spiritual danger, emotional danger, psychological danger, you know what you need to do to take care of you, right? You don't let yourself be harmed. You don't let yourself as best you can. Now, certainly there's enemies and strangers who might harm you. But when you're in a relationship with someone who harms you, Jesus says, he's got two things. One is for strangers. So if someone in power over you he says, if someone is in power over you, like in the government or the Roman citizen. So the Jews said, hey, when the soldier makes you walk a mile, walk two. When the soldier slaps you across the cheek, turn the other cheek. He's not talking about a relationship here. He's talking about an oppressive government. right? He's talking about an oppressor who's not a, a relationship to you. They're a stranger, but they're oppressing you. How do you handle that? You handle that with dignity. You handle that as a dignified human being. You don't pay back evil for evil. That's what Jesus says. But he says, when you're in a relationship with someone, when your brother or your sister, you're in a relationship with that person, a family member, sins against you, they hurt you, they harmed you. What do you do? Do you turn the other cheek? He doesn't say that. He says, you go to them. You say, hey, this isn't okay with me. And if they refuse to listen, like we've talked about, then what do you do? You tell. You don't isolate <laughs> Right? You tell someone and you get some support to confront this person. Like my father's pastor said, if your husband's abusing you, come to the elders. We'll support you. All right, tell. And if they still refuse to listen, so you can't change everybody. What do you do with the relationship then? Jesus says the relationship changes. He doesn't say treat them as a brother or sister. He says, treat them as a pagan or tax collector. The relationship is different. You don't trust them and you're not close to them. Doesn't mean you're not polite to them, but you're not close to them. The relationship itself changes. Those are Jesus's own words. Those aren't Leslie Burnick's words. Those are Jesus's own words. The relationship changes. Jesus is realistic. You cannot change everybody. Even people who are close to you, like a brother and a sister, if they refuse to listen. So your work is to get strong enough to be able to do that, right? And to recognize when you need to. All right. All right, two more questions, then we're going to go. How would you respond if your husband did call you the B word or something else? Um, <laughs> how would I respond? Ladies, you, you write in the chat, how would you respond if someone who was close to you, because maybe it's not your husband, maybe it'd be a parent or a girlfriend, if someone close to you, called you that word. And then that might be some community support. For me, if someone called me that word, uh, whether it was my husband or someone else, and I was, and I would self-reflect. So I think part of a healthy demeanor is when someone calls you a name or says something critical about you, even when it's harsh, that would be harsh. 
I would probably reflect and say, hmm, was I acting like one? Was I acting in a way that dishonored myself? So we talk a lot about core strength. And one of the steps of cores are I'm going to take responsibility for myself. And I'm going to be respectful toward others without dishonoring myself. And so if I were called that, I would first reflect because I don't want to be that. I don't want to act like that. So I would reflect to say, is there any truth to that? So I wouldn't just react and defend myself because maybe I, they shouldn't have used that word, but I might have been acting that way. So I might reflect and say, whew, that was like splashing cold water in my face. I don't really like the word, but I can understand that I wasn't behaving in a very honorable way. So I would own that if that's in fact what I was doing, especially if it was really unusual for them to do that. However, that's not usually the case, but I do want to make those exceptions. So if someone was doing that in a regular way to me, uh, whether it's my husband or whether it was my parent or whether it was my girlfriend, um, I would say to them, hey, I don't know why you're using that word, but that word is not okay with me. It's very offensive and I don't like to be called that. What am I specifically doing that makes you feel like you need to use that word with me. So I would ask a reflection question so that they can stop and look at the dynamic of what our relationship is, what's happening in our relationship. And if they say, you know what? I, I've been swearing so much lately. I just came out. I shouldn't be using that word with you or anybody. Or if they said, you know, because you're, because you're arguing with me, you're not doing what I want. So then I would say, so I'm not allowed to do what you, I'm not allowed to do what I want, I have to do everything you want, or I'm that. So I would, I would challenge them in that use of that word in our relationship, just like I would be saying, okay, so I think this is true. This is true in life. So here's, so again, I'll draw this picture. So when you're with your friend or your husband or whatever, and you guys are grooving along and you're doing fine, and then something happens, whatever, and you're not grooving along, <laughs> and there's friction in the relationship. So if somebody called me that name, there would be friction. We wouldn't be grooving along. And there'd be friction because of something I did that they didn't like and what they said that I didn't like, right? So something I did that they didn't like, and now they called me a name that I didn't like. So I think it's really important to, to address that. Like, what just happened here? I don't like you calling me that word. And what, what gave you the idea that you were supposed to call me that word? Like I would reflect, did I do something? If I didn't feel like I did anything that deserved that word, I would say, so what did I do here that set your teeth on edge that would make you call me that word? And say, well, you weren't listening to me. You weren't doing what I want. Okay, so in order for us to be good, I have to do everything you want? I can't do that, right? So you're kind of clarifying and defining the relationships. And I've had to do that with girlfriends. I've had, they haven't called me the name, but they have complained about me. You know, they've said, you know, you're, you're not doing this, you're not doing that. And I'm like, I don't think I can, I don't want to. So if that's the criteria for our friendship, in order for you not to be mad at me, then I don't know that we can be good friends because I'm not willing to do that. And so again, me establishing my boundary, my identity, what I will do, what I wanted me to cater more to them and do more of what they wanted to do and all that. And I'm like, I don't want to do that with, I don't want to have a friendship that I'm worried about upsetting you if I say no. <laughs> I don't want to have, I, don't, I have enough drama in my professional life. I don't want a lot of drama in my personal life. So I guess we're not gonna be friends. If I can't say no, I don't want to do that. Or no, I don't have time for that right now. And you're gonna call me a name. Mm, guess we're not gonna be friends. And I've just had to say that to sometimes to people, because I can, you know, be with you in a crowd and like, be polite, but we're more polite strangers. We're not gonna be good friends if I can't be myself. Right? Okay. Um, one more please sign up for the webinar. It's lesliebernick.com forward slash join. It's actually a workshop, but it's join webinar. It's going to be really a hands-on workshop. We're going to work together. My husband and I have been married 34 years. I always thought I would know if he was lying, but this last January, I found out he had been lying to me for months and hiding things. Now I'm always wondering if he's still lying to me. How can you tell? <laughs> you can't, honey. He's a good liar, obviously, right? You can't. So here's the deal. He broke your trust. What is he doing to rebuild that trust? When you break someone's trust, you can still love someone, but you don't trust them. I love the verse in Proverbs where it says that he talks about the husband trusting his wife. He trusts her to do him good, not 
harm all the days of your life. So this is, if I were you, this is a conversation I would have. I'm really un uncomfortable in our marriage right now. I don't trust you. You, you know, you're a really, really good liar. And um, you've hid things from me. I don't know for how long. I just don't know what I don't know. I just found out some stuff and I don't know what else I don't know. And I'm not sure what I'm going to do because I don't know if I can live with someone, continue to live with someone who kind of scares me because I don't know what you're up to and I don't trust you. And I would just be that blunt and see what his response to that is. So if his response is, I can totally see why you wouldn't trust me. You know, I've been hiding, I've been lying, I've been whatever. And you know, it's because of this and I promise I won't do it again. You can say, well, that's a good first start, but I don't believe you because you're a really good liar because you convinced me for 34 years that you were doing this and you weren't doing this. So how would I believe you? What, what? And so then your work to do is what action steps would he need to do to rebuild your broken trust? So it might be, hey, I, I, I want access to the financial records so I can check our bank accounts every day. I want to look at your phone and um, that those things would help me build back some trust. And if he says, I'm not doing that, I'm not going to be a dog on a leash that you're going to control say, okay, then what would you suggest that you do to build back my trust? Cause you broke my trust and you're a good liar. So I don't trust what you say. I only can watch what you do. So what would you suggest? And we'll talk some more about this in the webinar next week, but what would you suggest that you can do. I'm not doing anything. It's up to you. Trust me or not, your choice. If he goes that direction, understand you cannot trust him because he's shown no remorse, no repentance, and no acknowledgement that he has hurt, harmed your relationship. And he's not willing to do what it takes to rebuild that broken trust. Let me give you an illustration biblically. Because we always kind of spiritualize all this, like somehow I'm supposed to have grace and forgive him. And you might have to forgive him, but you still might not trust him. Um, two examples. And Paul is a really good example of this because Paul's the one who wrote that first Corinthians 13 chapter that we always use, like love bears all things, love believes all things. So therefore I have to trust him. Even if he says it, I know he's not telling me the truth. Somehow I have to put my brains in the <laughs> back shelf and believe him because that's what the Bible says. That is not what the Bible says. So Paul had two fractured relationships. One got mended, one didn't. The first fractured relationship we read about in Acts book of Acts in the Bible with John Mark. Remember, Paul and Barnabas went on a missionary journey and they took John Mark, which was Barnabas' nephew. And Barnabas, whatever, I'm not Barnabas, but John Mark, I don't know what happened. He wigged out, left, and Paul was like, done with him. We're not using him again. Now, John Mark is the one who wrote the book of Mark. So eventually he came around, but he was, he was in a place where he was kind of immature. And you read about that in Acts. So Barnabas says, no, I'm bringing John Mark back. I, you know, I think he's going to do well. And Paul says, I'm not, I'm not taking him. And they had a hot debate about John Mark. And so John Mark went with Barnabas and that's when they split. So Barnabas went, went his way, Paul went his way. But later we read in Timothy where Paul is talking to Timothy, he says, and bring John Mark with you. He's proved himself useful. So something happened between Acts and Timothy where John Mark repented and his actions showed Paul once again that he was trustworthy and he was helpful and he, Paul could trust him to follow through on what he said he would do. So reliability trust had been broken. He didn't automatically say, I just forgive you and I trust you again. He said, I'm not trusting him again. He, he was unreliable. Another example where the relationship didn't get healed was that Paul warns young Timothy, he says, watch out, Timothy, for Alexander the coppersmith, for he did me great harm. So he's warning Timothy, don't trust this guy. He, he's a scoundrel but we're supposed to just believe everybody and trust. No, we're not. The Bible says in Proverbs 25, putting trust in an unreliable person is like walking on a broken foot or chewing on a broken tooth. It's not smart. So the truth is, friend, you can't trust your husband because he is really a good liar. He's fooled you for all these years. So the question is, what action steps is he taking? And this is a little bit about the webinar stuff that we'll be going into deeper. So please sign up for the workshop next Wednesday. We're going to do two times at noon Eastern time and 730 Eastern time. I'm going to teach for an hour and then we're going to open it up to question and discussion. 
Meanwhile, you can talk with one another and there is something very healing about finding a tribe of women who know what your life is like and understand. So I want you to have that experience on the workshop. You have it a little bit here and it's also affirming, but in the workshop, you'll have it even more. And I want you to have that. So I want you to show up live. So could you do me a favor? If you've signed up on this uh, workshop, life gets busy, you forget. Could you go to your calendar right now and like circle the time you signed up for? Like, I want to be there and give yourself two hours of time, the time for the webinar and the time for the question and answer time afterwards so that you can really get what you need. You will get six months of therapy time in this two hour time for totally free. So we want you to really grow. We want you to have those aha moments, but we also want you to know what to do next. Once you see the road and the truth, how do you walk in it? And we want you to get those things. So I have so enjoyed our time together today. I will see you tonight at 7.30. We're going to talk about marriage counseling and why it doesn't work in these situations. And so I hope you come back and sign up for the webinar now, but come back tonight and we'll do another Facebook Live. Remember when we're talking about marriage stuff, specifically this way we talked about isolation, but marriage stuff, this is my public Facebook page. Um, don't get too naked. All right, take care. Bye-bye. See you tonight.